background to this project came about because no new information had been produced on storage pests since the production of this book that came out in the 1990s. Um, the project is understanding and managing pests of stored grain. The information that came into this book was based on some surveys that took place in the 1970s and 1980s and since that time practices have changed quite a lot and we don't have an up-to-date understanding of what's going on in silos and in storage currently. The other part of the project is that we are reliant on a single organophosphate product, permethos methyl, for control of pests in stored grain. With organophosphates being under increased scrutiny overseas, their long-term use is something we need to think about understanding a bit more and also there has been resistance confirmed to permethos methyl overseas. We have anecdotal reports of that resistance happening here in New Zealand but nothing as yet confirmed. So it's not just FAB that's involved, we also have support from the Ministry for Primary Industries Sustainable Farming Fund and also industry and farmers. At this stage the project is getting an idea of the frequency and distribution of pests that we have here in New Zealand, particularly focusing in on Canterbury. The idea then is to then correlate that to management practices and try and get an understanding of whether resistance is happening here in New Zealand. So it started with an initial survey, we did a primary pilot study. In that primary pilot study growers were invited to submit grain samples which were then analysed. We had about 60 people from across New Zealand send us grain samples and from that about 75% of them were infected with one or more insect species. The predominant species was sawtooth grain beetle which surprised us somewhat. Uh, we were expecting a, a greater incidence of weevils, we didn't find any. And the other species we found were quite a lot of socids, so that's book lice, soft bodied insects. Part of the problem with the initial survey is because it was an invitation survey, the people who submitted samples, we had concerns that they might already be suitably concerned about the grain in their silos, thereby bringing in some surveying bias. So stage two happened last year. Uh, we needed to make sure that that sampling was random to try and eliminate that sampling bias. So we had 42 growers selected at random and we sampled their silos between October and September and October of last year. They did. Uh, we found that 77% of those farmers that we went back to had some level of insect infestation. We found that about 90% of them were pre-treating their grain before or pre-treating their silos before the grain went in and a further 79% of those were treating the grain as it went in and the vast majority of that was with permethos methyl. Again we found sawtooth grain beetles and socids were our most common although this time we did actually find a species of weevil in one of the samples. So the pests, that, the majority of the pests that we found are actually secondary pests. So they are pests that will infect grain that's already had some sort of damage to it, whether it's mechanical or whether the grain has gone into the store at a slightly high temperature or a high moisture. Um, things like if you've harvested on a really, really hot day, the temperature of your grain can be that much higher. And if you're putting your grain into a silo that's maybe 200 or 400 tonnes, it takes a long time for that grain bulk to cool down. And these pests really love high moisture and high temperature environments and that's one of the ways that they can get in and start breeding and replicating really quickly. There's three really important ways in which they can do that and the first, of, the first most important is really good hygiene practices in and around the silos. So making sure that the silo is clean, making sure that the area around the silo is clean, making sure that there's no bags of grain left hanging around or grain left in August because these species only need a really small amount of grain to be able to increase and breed really quickly. Another thing, a really important tool that farmers can use is aeration. So I talked about how they like to have high temperatures. If you can cool your grain using aeration, if you can cool it down to 15 degrees or lower, that's a really big thing that you can do to prevent the spread of, of pests. And another thing that you can do is regular monitoring. So about once a month is, is a good number of times to be sampling. You can run some, run some grain off the bottom, have a look at it, expose it to a bit of light, some species like to be exposed to a bit of light and will come out, some will hide away. Keep the samples and you can record whether or not you have presence or absence of bugs using production wise. 
and those records can be stored and also to store the sample of the grain until it's until the grain in that silo has meet, meet, reached its end point. At the end of this project we would hope that we would have resistance confirmed or not and how to manage such a, a resistance if it does develop. Um, we're also looking at best management practices and looking at the system going forward if we do lose OPs in the future and how we can look at our system and develop it to make sure it's sustainable and robust going forward. We've just finished year one of the project. In 2015-16 we ran our pilot study which fed into the current year. We have in the last year we've done our surveying and we are now currently breeding up insects in our lab to conduct future resistance testing and developing a mini silo method that we're hoping to take forward into years two and three. Brian, who or what is the seed vault? The Spallard Global Seed Vault is the backup to the global system of conservation of crop diversity. It is where collections go to make sure that their collections are safe in the future. So that they make a safety backup like a safety deposit box in a bank. So, Brian, who's funding it? The seed vault was built and funded by the Norwegian government in 2008. The annual operating costs of the seed vault um, are provided by the Crop Trust and the Norwegian government. Uh, the work of maintaining the collection is managed by the Nordic Gene Bank, Nordgen. Did they come up with the idea? A long time ago, the Nordic Gene Bank actually stored crop, their crop collection in an abandoned cave mine up in Svalbard. The idea of conserving and backing up diversity has been around for a hundred or so years, even more. And this concept of the seed vault um, was thought about by many people, but the reason why the seed vault in Longyearbyen now exists is because of a man named Kerry Fowler. He was the director of the Crop Trust, and he recognized that we needed this backup. And so he approached the Norwegian government to create this seed vault in Norway, and uh, that's how it all started. Who's the Crop Trust? The Crop Trust is an international organization working to conserve crop diversity worldwide. We are working to create and fund a global system for the conservation of crop diversity in crop collections worldwide. Now, an interesting thing, but why was Norway chosen? Svalbard is an interesting choice for the location of the vault, and it has many reasons as to why it's there. One being that there is the Svalbard Treaty, which allows for anybody to basically be in the area, meaning that you can have seeds from North Korea and South Korea on the same shelf. Other reasons include the fact that it's cold. It's, it's the farthest north you can fly in a commercial airline. Um, and in the permafrost, in the mountain, you have a consistent temperature of minus seven degrees Celsius. The optimal storage uh, conditions for seeds for long-term conservation is minus 18 degrees Celsius. So you already have a, a degree of cold that you don't have to bring down um, through artificial cold, uh, which makes it a good place to do that in comparison to a plus 40 degree weather in the Philippines. Having picked the ideal spot, how do you actually choose the seeds that you're going to store? Around the world, there are about 1,750 collections of crop diversity. Not all of them contain unique varieties. These collections contain about 7 million varieties, but only 2 to 2.5 of these are unique. So the seed vault is meant to store the unique diversity of crops. So in order to deposit to the seed vaults, collections are required to deposit unique varieties. And these crops are only for food security. So it's only agricultural crops? There is one box in the seed vault that contains flora and fauna, and that is from the local Svalbard area. The rest of the collection in the seed vaults is for agricultural crops. Why one box? Um, the one box of flora and fauna from Svalbard was chosen as a um, consideration um, for the fact that the seed vault is located on this far northern archipelago um, in Longyearbyen. And it was a collection that the university put together, and it was kind of a symbolic representation of diversity uh, and life in Svalbard. How up to date are you as far as the vault is concerned? The seed vault gets deposits uh, from collections three times a year, and currently contains more than 830,000 different samples. Um, obviously, we would like to get it to the full 2 to 2.5 unique varieties in the world, um, but that's a long process. 
Now, the varieties, you've got some basic ones like rice, for I, I guess, but what about, is there anything sort of GM? Um, so I'll start with the rice question. Um, in the world, there are about 200,000 varieties of, of rice. These are all unique varieties, um, and the majority of them are stored inside the seed vaults. Um, the seed vault contains this natural diversity from across the world, about 830,000, 40,000 varieties. Uh, Norwegian law prohibits GM crops and food from entering their borders. So likewise, the seed vaults uh, does not allow GM crops. Any withdrawals being made from the bank so far? In 2015, we saw the first seed retrieval from the seed vaults. This was a collection called the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, and they held their collection in Aleppo, Syria. Because of the civil strife, the collection was not able to um, maintain uh, the work required of it. Collections in the world are not only meant to hold as a backup, but they're actually meant to work with scientists and breeders. They're meant to send and share the material so that we can improve agriculture for the future. They were unable in the conditions in Aleppo, Syria now, or in the past five years, to really do their job as effectively as possible. Now, they were doing a great job. They were still sending out shipments of seeds, you know, with war going on. Uh, but it wasn't optimal. And so ICARDA decided that it was time for them to reestablish their collection in a different country that they could more safely resume their activities. So in October, um, sorry, September of 2015, they received about 38,000 varieties from the seed vault that they had deposited, because only those who deposit can retrieve their seeds, and brought them to Morocco and Lebanon to restart their collection. Is it a concern that there has been a withdrawal? Of course, we don't want that to happen. We don't want seeds to be withdrawn, um, because it means something's bad happened in the world. Um, but it proves the, the point that the seed vaults exist for a reason, and we need it. And it proves the point that this work is extremely important. And before the seed vaults, uh, this work didn't get the credit it deserved. People are working on a daily basis to make sure that the food on your plate remains into the future. Um, and, and the seed vault provides that safety net. What role do you see for the future? So the collections around the world are doing the actual work on a day-to-day -day basis. They're working with scientists and breeders to develop new crops. But as shown in Syria, things can happen. There are natural disasters, there are war, there's war, anything could happen to these collections. And the seed vault is integral in making sure that we don't lose these options for the future. Each single seed might provide a trait that can be used to adapt to a new condition, whether it's a pest and disease, drought, climate change, anything. And the seed vault provides this backup for our food security system. So what's the crop trust involvement? The crop trust uh, is working to create this global system and fund it. Uh, we, are, we were built in 2004 to establish an endowment fund that would provide the necessary funding that these collections around the world need on a yearly basis. Because something as simple as a power outage or not paying the electricity bill can result in the loss of diversity and an extinction event. So our job is to make sure that these collections are secure. So we are working to raise money to do this. We are very happy that um, just this year, New Zealand made uh, an announcement, a pledge of two million New Zealand dollars to the endowment. And uh, we are working with countries around the world to raise that endowment fund. Has New Zealand actually made a contribution as yet? We will have a deposit to the Svalbard Global Seed Vaults on Monday, the 23rd of May. Uh, it will become uh, the first deposit by New Zealand. Uh, the Margot Ford Germplasm Center will deposit around 700 varieties of crops. Uh, clover and ryegrass will be deposited by New Zealand. So we're very excited to welcome the first deposit by New Zealand. So apart from Norway and New Zealand, what other countries are involved, if any? As of right now, we have 66 different institutions that have deposited to the seed vaults. We'd obviously like that number to grow, um, but that's at times difficult. We require funding, um, political uh, interference can, can occur. But the seeds in the seed vaults have originated from every single country in the world. So we're getting there. 
What else is the Crop Trust involved in? While the Crop Trust is building this global system and working to manage and fund many of these collections around the world, uh, we're also working to fill the gaps in the global system. There are crops growing in the wild in natural conditions without human influence that are the wild cousins of what is grown in our fields today. These crop wild relatives contain hardy traits that we can use to adapt our agriculture to the conditions we face in the future. So through a 10-year con commitment from the Norwegian government, we are collecting, conserving, and using these crop wild relatives to improve our agriculture. And we're very excited about this. Uh, we have collecting agreements with nearly 20 countries, and we will be going out over the next two years and collecting this diversity, storing them in collections, eventually backing them up in the seed vaults, um, but also providing them to breeders so that they can use them to improve agriculture, to, to improve the crops that we have in our fields today against the rising temperatures, pests and diseases, which these crops in the wild naturally are protecting against. What about the United Nations? Do they have a role as far as the whole diversity is concerned? The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals actually have a target in there in goal two of ending hunger. 2.5 says by 2020, we should conserve the diversity and wild diversity of crops in the gene banks in the world, the international, national, and regional collections. So this is a very good indication that the governments of the world recognize the importance of crop diversity and recognize the importance of using this diversity to adapt our agriculture and be able to feed our future despite climate change and despite the challenges of a rising population. Guy, the sheep industry, is it in good heart? Well, it's had better times. We're down to 29, 000, 29 million sheep in the country now. We've sort of dropped below the magic 30 million, which is a bit of a concern. Um, lots of good things happening, farm IQ and developments along the way. It's, they are finding new, innovative ways to increase, increase production. And probably the biggest thing that's, slopped, that's stopped the decrease in the sheep industry is the downturn of the dairy industry. So the option for moving out of sheep, the other more attractive options have become limited in the short term. Um, but there's still some fundamental problems with what, what farmers are receiving for their product. And so yeah, what, one of the things we're looking at is alternatives to a traditional lamb production um, to try and create more, more profit for sheep farmers. So are you suggesting that we go away from meat and wool and into sheep dairying? Well, no, I'm not saying move away from meat and wool, but I'm saying there's another string to your bow and get into dairying. Yeah. And um, the, sh the sheep dairy industry is quite keen on setting up, well, the group I'm involved with, setting up protocols where we do rear the lambs, we don't euthanise lambs, and so there's a win-win for the, the meat industry as well as the, dairy, the sheep dairy industry and you can produce wool on the side as well. The guy most people would say sheep dairying year? I, I actually heard um, Joni Williams on Origin Earth on, on one of the farming programs recently talking about the hardest people to convince are uh, sheep farmers. And I can recall in my previous life as a farmer going out docking and forgetting our milk, as often happens, and it never occurred to us to milk the sheep to provide our milk. And so I do understand where that reticence comes from and it seems to be pretty ingrained in our, our our British background even though the Brits did have a background in sheep dairy going way back but it's more of a European concept as opposed to a British concept and so yeah with our strong British background we, we do have reservations around milking of sheep but having said that it's gaining real traction um, New Zealand's in the vicinity of having 30,000 milking sheep in the country now. It's still not up to goat um, numbers yet, but it's catching up. And, and goat numbers aren't decreasing there, over 50,000. So there looks to be the start of a, of a viable industry occurring in New Zealand. Plant. Where do you get plant from? 
Well, we have a small, a small um, dairy um, farm set up at home at our place, and we actually got goat plant from the goat industry. And I think that's if people were setting up for new plant, um, going to the Waikato and talking to the people who manufacture the plant for goat farmers would be very comparable to sheep farming. There might be some subtle changes. The sheep argue with a slightly bigger animal, the East region is anyway, there may be a bit of lengthening in the plant, but by and large what works for goats works for, works for sheep. Now you mentioned East Frisian, are they the, the breed of choice? Yeah, that, that's really the only option. Um, Jock Allison, when he brought the, um, the East Frisian and the Awasi breed into New Zealand, the Awasi being a Middle Eastern breed, fat tail breed, that's also a very good milk producer. And the Israelis actually have a breed called the Asaf, which is a combination of the um, East Frisian and the Awasi, and it suits their conditions very well. But, and, and they both have, have different strengths and weaknesses. The East Frisian is a more of a dual purpose animal, um, probably got better feet than the Awasi, which is relevant for New Zealand conditions, but it's also reasonably prone to lung infection, viral pneumonia particularly. I think that as the breed has developed in New Zealand, it's improved in that regard, but it's still, it's still an issue. With the Awasi, possibly slightly less production, certainly less lambs, um, a hairy wool, and it's not as, um, as big as the East region, but a combination of the two might be a useful, a useful mix in the future where they can complement each other. But there are very few Awasi available in New Zealand. There is a, a flock in the North Island, in the, um, Hawke's Bay, but they're pretty much tied up by their owners for the um, live shipment trade into Australia or genetics for that, from what I understand. So here at Lincoln you've got your heart and soul in it and you're researching it? Yeah, well, um, my, yeah, my passion is the sheep dairy industry. We're, we've, um, we've put a lot of our own money into it at home. We don't have a, we don't have a unit here on Lincoln as yet. It'd be nice to see one for small, small remnants, sheep and goats. I think there's a place for it. But, and so we do a lot of our research around modelling, be it through um, different computer-based modelling and we can replicate a farm pretty well with that. And um, so that's what we use to, to um, do our research around sheep dairy. Having said that, um, our, our students do get exposed to it. We, we have a southern tour. We take our third year students around the southern part of the South Island, through Southland, and we almost invariably call into uh, Blue River, or Antares Ag is their sheep dairy side of it, the farming side of it's called, and spend a morning on the sheep dairy farms there. And we're using our, our block at home, which is 20 minutes away, to take selected students out and introduce them to the sheep dairy concept out there as well. So, um, so while we don't have a, a lot of presence of sheep dairy here at Lincoln itself, we do expose the students to them and I mean, am managing to brainwash a few along the way to the ideals of getting into sheep dairy. And it, it's, it's surprising how, how receptive the students are. They, they see the potential as a, a leg into the leg into an agricultural industry without having to fork out a lot and it's a really good way to add another string to the farming bow so mum and dad and the children can come home and have different parts of the farm by having these two different industries working together. Brian, who or what is Geosun? Uh, Geosun was a, is a company founded by a group of four of us. Uh, when um, we stumbled across the idea of multiple source energy recovery on farms. So after a period of research, uh, we established the company and um, hit the market in the later part of last year. So there's three different forms of energy? Yes, we, we start with the principle that there is enough energy on any particular farm in this country on any particular day to satisfy the energy requirements of that property. Unfortunately, it's not always in the form that you would like. So by using three different forms of energy recovery, we're able to uh, provide it in a format that the farmer can use. 
The farmer just pushes the button or turns the handle or opens the valve. He doesn't have to worry about where the energy is coming from. What our system does is, is capture the energy and put it in a format that he needs to use. So what are the three? Well, we all start with the sun. The sun is the vital ingredient in a property like this uh, to grow the grass and it's the, it's the greatest uh, um, energy source we have on the planet. So solar energy is obviously an important one. And from that you can see what I mean by each form having its advantages or disadvantages. Obviously solar energy is not so good uh, during the night and, and on cloudy days like this. From there we go to a geothermal energy exchange and again we think of the sun as a source of that. Uh, a lot of the sun's energy doesn't go into grass, it doesn't do anything else, it just heats the surface of the planet. And that energy is stored there for us by the planet. So by um, finding a way to exchange that energy, to bring it to the surface, then that's another form we can use for heating or cooling. Uh, and the third type, again started with the sun, because the sun was necessary to grow the grass. The cow ate that grass, turned some of it into milk and some of it into waste. And that waste still has energy in it. And from that, um, through the anaerobic digester process, we can turn that waste into biogas. Uh, now biogas um, is an interesting material and you can use it for generating electricity or heat but it's very good to store, very easy to store. So there's another reason why you would have three types. They all have their advantages, and when you put them together, you get a self-sufficient energy system on a farm. So you're tying all three into one? Yeah, that's really the, the key to it, Rob. Uh, all the technologies I've just mentioned are not new. They have been around the world in various forms for many, many years, and in the case of biodigesters, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, what is new is the ability to bring them all into one network so the farmer doesn't have to think when he turns on the irrigation pump where that particular electricity is coming from. All he needs to know is that it's working. Uh, so um, that idea of a common network that the energy can be put into is the, is the real crux of what we've achieved. Now looking at this farm, you've got several irrigators, you've got probably several homes, and you've also got a dairy shed. Are you suggesting that you can come off the grid? That would be the ultimate goal, um, and certainly on a property like this, there's 720 odd cows being milked here. Um, so we could very definitely go off grid here by a combination of all three of the energy types I spoke of. Now, I want to know more about this hole in the ground business because to most people that's real smoke and mirror stuff. Yes, a lot of people in New Zealand hear the word geothermal and they think of Taupo and Rotorua and those sort of places and they're right, that is geothermal energy. Um, however, there are other forms of geothermal energy, what we refer to as low temperature geothermal and that is simply um, the energy which is stored in the surface of the earth itself. When you go down um, a few metres, you'll find that things start to, to heat up. In fact, they stay at a temperature far higher than the ambient temperature. By the time you're down 15 metres, that temperature is stable. It doesn't move much between summer and winter, night or day, wet season, dry season. So if you can harness that energy and bring that to the surface, where you can then connect it to, say, um, a refrigeration plant to, to use to cool the milk on a farm, or to the hot water cylinders used for washing the, uh, the dairy down at the end of milking, then that energy, of course, the sun gave it to you, you've got it for free, there are no moving parts required to get it to the surface, all we're doing is using the um, law of fluid, one of the laws of fluid dynamics, which is the law of equilibrium, where if you put two substances together, their heat or their, their temperature will match over time. So if you've got a nice warm constant temperature under your feet and we put some cold water down there, that water will come to the surface having absorbed the energy from the, from the earth. Likewise, we take some hot water from the surface because it's just gone through and taken that heat from the milk and put it down the hole, then it discharges that heat into the earth. And so by that simple process, we can use it to heat um, the hot water and chill the milk. Brian, it's been trialled and proved in the Northern Hemisphere? 
Yeah, it's a pretty common practice. Low temperature geothermal uh, in Europe, Canada and the United States is, a, is a, an everyday way of heating. If you look at Germany, for instance, they've got 300,000 geothermal closed loop systems uh, operating throughout the country and an awful number of those for domestic heating. Um, here in Christchurch, uh, eight of the new buildings going up for the rebuild um, have geothermal heating and cooling. Christchurch International Airport has used geothermal energy for heating and cooling for the last decade. Um, so it's not, um, it's not new technology, as I said before. It's just a new way of applying it and this idea of bringing it all onto one network. So I guess if you do use all three, you can totally cut your electricity bills. They'll be gone. Yes, it's about lowering that cost, lowering that cost of production. If you're not paying the power bill, you're using what you've already got which you got for free, um, your, your cost of production goes down. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try Growsure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with Growsure from KiwiCare. Farm safety has now changed, there's new rules and regulations, but you guys have come up with an electronic solution. Yeah, so we wanted to create a system that was simple for farmers to use. Um, so we were really struggling um, to manage health and safety in a corporate dairy business um, that we used to work for. And so we just wanted a, to create a tool that was simple for people to use and was effective and engaged the team in, in health and safety as well. And each farm has got its own system? Yeah, so each farm has a, a, its own system and it has a farm map um, where farmers can um, just drop pins onto the map um, which has which are, all the pins are risks and then um, each risk has some information associated with it in terms of uh, what it is and some of the safety information that people need to know and to, to be aware of um, so that people are aware of the risk when they come to the farm. So on their computer they put a boundary, a virtual boundary around their property? It's got a geo fence, which is a virtual fence around the around the uh, the property. So when someone arrives uh, on the farm and they have the app on their phone, um, the app or the system knows that they're there, um, and so it'll prompt them and say, "Hey, you you've arrived at the farm, and uh, you, you know we'd like you to um, yeah, review the risks, uh, and so that you're aware of them, and then you can acknowledge them and sign in." So this is great because this system is in lieu of a holder of paper and a shed somewhere, whether it be the dairy or the wool shed or whatever. Yeah, so we're trying to get away from paper. Paper's painful on a farm. Um, it's not really fit for purpose because, you know, farming environments are often weird and dirty and um, they cover a large area. Um, and so paper just isn't fit for purpose in, 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 on far, in farms. So uh, we've made something that's electronic, it's mobile, it's with you all the time. And so you can access the information wherever you are. If you're in the back paddock, you can, you know, you can hop on your mobile and you can see what, you know, the risks that are around you that are relevant to you at the time. So. And going back to paper, of course, those books or whatever that we're supposed to sign in on, they, they could be anywhere and nobody knows if the farm is there or not and it's a bit confusing. It could be anywhere, yeah. Yeah, you don't know where it's going to be. So, you know, often it'll be in the dairy shed if it's a dairy or it might be in the wool shed, but, you know, it's, you know, often you don't know where it's going to be, so um, it's easier if it's just on your phone. So as a television presenter doing a farming programme, I go onto obviously a lot of farms, so I can use this system myself to sign in. 
Yeah, so you'd download the app um, and you'd be uh, a user that visited farms for business reasons, probably. Um, and so uh, you'd just download the app and any farm that you went to that used Onside, uh, when you arrived, it would just alert you that you'd arrived at the farm and you'd go through the process of um, looking at the risks and it'd only show you the risks that you hadn't seen before, so it's not going to drag you through things that you're already aware of. So we try to make um, the risks that you see the most relevant. Um, and then you'll review those, check them out, um, acknowledge that you've read them and sign in. Um, and so then, and then once you've arrived, the farm manager will, the farm team will get an alert that you've arrived and they have your contact details on their phone and that sort of stuff. So if you're a truck driver, for example, uh, who's going to be coming onto a farm to spread fertiliser, the farmer A knows where you are and that you're there, but you also are in instant contact with the farmer. Yeah, so you know, it's great for truck drivers because they don't need to get out of their truck. They can just um, roll on in, it'll alert them, um, they sign in, um, and then they can actually check out the risks that are in the paddock where they are rather than having to you know, look at a map that you know, has a whole lot of irrelevant information on it. And of course, security-wise, as a farmer, you, can, you know, in fact, who is on your farm. Yeah, so it's got a cool uh, feature that I think um, farmers uh, quite like. You know, that's the feedback we've had, um, which is the who's on my farm feature. So anyone that's on your farm uh, at any time that has the Onside app, it'll you can go onto the who's on my farm um, feature and, and it'll tell you exactly who's on your farm and how long they've been there. And you can also go back and, and look at a history of who's, on, who's been on your farm. So it's good for tracking hours and things like that. What if there's no cell phone coverage? You know, so we've spent a, we've thought hard about that, and so we've built a lot of offline capability into the system. Um, so um, if you uh, go to a, you know a farm that doesn't have good cellular reception, then um, it'll still know you're there because the GPS usually works. Um, so not often that the GPS won't have signal. So um, you can uh, so the system will still know you're there. It'll prompt you to sign in, and but what you do need to have done is to pre-download the risks. So you can do that um, when you're in if you know you're going to a farm that doesn't have a good cellular reception, you pre-download the risks um, and then when you arrive it's like having an online experience. What about battery usage? So yeah, because OnSite has location detection technology, um, it's a question a lot of people ask us, is it going to drain their battery? So um, we spent a lot of time and effort with the team at Jade to figure out a cool um, way to um, you make sure it doesn't use a lot of battery, so it only uses your location for a, a small period of time, a short period of time when you're when you're actually um, when you're close to the farm and about to go into the boundary, um, and then after that, it just the location detection slows down and stops. So, um, you, our experience, what we've felt is it doesn't use too much battery. It's probably fifth or sixth on the list of battery users on your phone. What are the costs? So the system is going to be free for April, and then from then it's ten dollars a user a month. Do you buy an annual contract, or, or what's the system? No, so you buy a monthly contract, and you can cancel at any time. So um, you just you know pay for the people on your team or yourself, and then if you aren't finding value with the with the system, then you just cancel. And if there's an incident, I guess you can report that on your cell phone or on your computer. Yeah, so um, the app on the on the mobile um, or on the mobile and on the web you can um, record or report a, a risk or, a, or an incident so you can also report a new risk. Um, so if you report an incident um, you put in the details, all the details that you need to put in there and um, the farm administrators get an alert that a new uh, incident's been logged and then you can go onto, on, then the administrators will go online later onto the website and they'll, they can manage that as they need to. The authorities must love you guys. Yeah so you know what we're trying to do is make it easy for farmers. Um, none of the information is available to the authorities. You know they have to go and actually sit down with the farmer um, to you know to go through the information. So it's not you know, we're not sharing information with anyone. It's um, it's just you know so it's up to the, the farmer holds the key to the information. But we think it'll make it easier for farmers to work with the authorities to make to, you know to have a, a living, breathing health and safety plan. You know that's what I was meaning is you know because you're making it simple. Well, yeah, hopefully it makes it easier for everyone. What's the feedback been like? So we've, um, we've been testing this system with farmers and you know, our friends and family and other farmers for you know, a few months now, and we've had lots of really good feedback. But you know, I think um, the feedback farmers give us is the most important thing. So you know, based on that feedback, we want to continue to invest in the product and make it better over time. So um, for us, this is the first step. And uh, you know, as we get new ideas from users, we'll continue to try and build it and make it better. Constant R and D, I guess, for you guys. We want to have a continual R and D process that's just going all the time. So we want to roll new features out, which you know is based on user feedback. So we want to hear from people, you know, how it's going, how we can improve it, and what else they need. 
Who's involved? So the people, uh, so, so we've got these three of us, three, uh, three of us uh, founded um, Onside, so there's myself, um, Juliet McLean and Michael Falconer. And what about the future, where are you taking this? Yeah, so um, this is the first step for us, um, we want to continue to um, develop new cool solutions for farmers that are mobile and you know, and take the pain away of, of problems that they're having on the farm and solutions they need to, solutions for problems that they're they need solving. And it's a small team but I guess that team will grow. Yeah so we've the you know, there's just uh, the three of us right now, um, but yeah, you know, this is just the first step, and we'll continue to grow as as we need, and and hopefully we can grow our team and and get lots of other cool people involved. Not sure how to brighten up your backyard? Try Grow Sure Easy Flowers, all in one mix. Seed, feed, mulch. It's blooming easy. Be sure with Grow Sure from Kiwi Care. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture. Or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Northland out at the Whangarei Heads, it's a challenging bit of land. Yes it can be at times of the year Rob, it's um, coastal, um, can be dry and also can have a, a serious amount of rain as well. So yeah we've, we are challenged and we've got pastures that you don't see all around the countryside which are more difficult to manage and, that, and that's Kaikuyu pastures. So tell me about the property. So the, the property is 550 hectares, of which 235 is dairy, uh, dairy platform, and the rest is dairy support, and also we run a dairy beef operation, which we su um, support from taking the uh, calves from the dairy cows to Angus Jersey Cross and carrying them through to finishing. So you're spreading your risk? Yeah, we have spread our risk, but we've also um, taken advantage of the, the the quality Jersey Cross animal that come out of the dairy cows. Good on you for using jerseys. It's um, starting to pick up again, it's getting a bit of momentum again, um, but uh, you know they they do provide a, a quality beef animal and, and that's not highly recognised. Um, those that know the animal um, know that the um, the beef quality that comes out of them and the finishing ability is, is, a, is a really good product. Do you get a certain amount of marbling with that? Yes we are, yes, and um, AgriSearch did some work a number of years ago and they utilised some of our animals that uh, looked at the marbling effect. So there, there is, a, is a bit of marbling, it's probably not as much as a Wagyu animal which is specifically bred for that, but um, it's a really good balanced uh, meat product. Now the rainfall, it's pretty varied. Yeah, so generally we, um, we range from 650 mils of rain in a low year to um, 1,100, 1,200 in a, in a wet year. So, so there, there is a range. Um, and being in the north, we, we tend to get um, a little bit more subtropical flow. So particularly this year is a, an example where um, the weather patterns have brought more subtropical type flows and our uh, rain... Um, falls tend to be large dumps as opposed to spread evenly across the year. So our challenge is actually managing when the rain falls. 
So wet winters, um, dry summers generally, um, and with subtropical dumps. And there's humidity. And humidity, yes. There's, there's, a, there's a fair amount of that with, with that subtropical east, um, air flows, particularly an easterly um, pattern like we've had for the last two months. Um, a lot of humidity, and um, which brings in itself flies, facial eczema challenges, and bugs of various descriptions. So it, it, yeah, there's a number of challenges. <laughs> what sort of pasture do you use up here? Yes, this is Kaikuyu country, and obviously um, driving a per hectare performance is, is what we're looking for. Um, so the Kaikuyu does alter um, its growing points during the year. Uh, it, it doesn't grow during that early spring period um, very vigorous, vigorously where you're trying to feed a whole lot of newly calved um, cows. So we use a lot of Italian um, grasses to fill those holes, uh, but then we use a summer cropping regime and a permanent pasture regime after that to put new varieties of pastures in to fill those gaps. So what are you using? Well, uh, we started off using um, uh, perennial ryegrass, the, the, the normal perennial ryegrass um, um, makeups of, of pastures, but we're finding they're not lasting. The, the, the kaikuyu reverts really, really quickly over the sort of two or three-year period, and they don't cope with um, those drier points that we get. So we're looking at alternative species, and we've trended to more fescues and uh, coxfoots. Uh, we've used a little bit of lucerne in the last year, uh, doing a bit of work around legumes. So we're trying to find a pasture that's going to be um, resilient in terms of those dry points and deeper rooting and, and can make use of the moisture that's here and, and, and um, um, add, so add the weather yeah. Yep. Yep. I've sort of quietly smiled really because you enjoyed the seed force range so much you ended up working with them. That's right, it is. It is all right. We've been working them ever since they started um, and I think this year it's 10 years since they've been in operation and we've been involved for that 10 years. Initially um, as a trial farm in terms of putting some, some trials on um, and on, on, the, on the seed basis we've identified it through, uh, identified through those trials uh, pastures that have actually grown really well here and so we've pursued those varieties and uh, that's really important that w we identify varieties that grow well in this environment. Um, so from that basis they provide a product that actually really does suit what we're looking for and suit what the animal's looking for. Um, and we've also had a relationship through a, um, a sponsorship arrangement with um, my son's rally car for, for a number of years, which was very productive for both of us. Palatability is just so important. It's, it's really important, and uh, there are a number of varieties on the market that are just marketed through yield, and uh, yield is one thing, but unless the animal that's eating them um, wants to eat them, uh, and then can turn that into something productive, then you know, you're really wasting your time. So uh, Seed Force, um, one of their philosophies is that they're actually breeding plant varieties that, are, um, that the animal likes to eat and is productive. So, so that's important to us as well. Um, the, uh, we, we, and we get, um, we get tied up with um, persistence and um, having ryegrass species persisting longer and uh, you know, some of those varieties are inflicted with various um, ranges of endophytes. Uh, endophytes, um, yes they do protect them from insect damage and make them persistent but some of the varieties are actually the cows don't enjoy eating and we, we've seen evidence of that and so we've actually steered away from endophyte variety pastures for that reason because animals actually don't like eating them and that's why they persist. That's a pretty good sort of an idea. I hadn't thought it persists because they're not being eaten. Yes, and it persists for two reasons. One is the animal refuses to eat uh, lower than it needs to and, and that allows the crown to, to, to still survive. But also we've seen evidence of um, some of the pastures um, animals walking around and not wanting to eat it and they're able to reseed which, which allows them to continue to persist and, and stay in the environment. 
and that's I suppose why the purest wild endophyte is so persistent in that it's actually not very palatable to an animal so that's that's why it stays there so um, in terms of plant breeding I've identified endophytes that both protect from insects but also um, give that bit of survival. So finally Murray the industry where it is I guess you're going to have to work smarter rather than harder. Yeah we're in a tough period of time at the moment um, the, the world prices are under pressure and uh, commodity prices are under pressure with um, oversupply around the world. Um, you know, we need to be really smart in terms of one, what we do on farm, um, to reinforce our pasture based system to ensure that we're actually leveraging the most we can out of what we grow. And, and that's a little bit what we try to do in terms of the varieties and, and the species we plant. Uh, so we need to come back to come back to the basic fundamentals, go back to our um, um, basic fundamentals on how we operate and what made us efficient in the first place. But also in terms of a, of a marketing arm, um, we need to be smart in terms of capturing all the high value markets we can capture and also protect our brand and, and market um, who we are and, and what we produce, um, as opposed to just be commodity traders on the market with everybody else. I'm Rob Cope Williams. If you want to catch up on what we've been talking about, don't forget to go to our website. It's ontheland.co.nz and we're also on Facebook, as you'll find when you go on to that. As I said, I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.